Hello, everyone. Welcome. We'll just wait like a minute as people trickle in. I always feel like I need to curate a selection of jokes to tell during the awkward pre-webinar start. <laughs> Who's the funniest curator you've ever met? <laughs> Curators aren't really funny, typically. <laughs> Curators aren't really nice a lot of the time. <laughs> no comment. <laughs> cool. All right. Well, I think I'm going to go ahead and kick us off and people can continue to join as they will. So thank you everyone for joining us this evening. I'm Emma Saperstein, I'm the curator of the MEOC Gallery at Cuesta College, um, which is a contemporary art space uh, in on the central coast of California. If you're interested in following our work and potentially joining other events, we do lots of artist talks, conversations. Um, I will post a link to our website in the chat. Um, Christopher and I have been talking about doing this event for a while and I'm glad it's finally come to fruition. We still need to schedule that studio visit, um, but hopefully soon. Um, before we get started, I'm going to um, kick us off with a land acknowledgement as we open all our events that way. Uh, the Harold J. Miosi Art Gallery gratefully acknowledges that our gallery rests on the traditional lands of the coastal band of the Chumash Nation, including the Abispeño, members of the Chumash and language family and any other native tribes who made their homes along the west coast of Central California. As a step towards acknowledging and honoring this sovereign nation, our organization pledges a commitment to indigenous rights and cultural equity. Since we have gathered digitally, we will be honoring the indigenous people whose land many of us are physically gathered on, although I know we have a, a Los Angeles constituent here tonight. Um, we do this as a way of acknowledging the people who are present in San Luis Obispo as the past, present, and future caretakers of the land. Um, so thanks again for joining. Um, we are, uh, this event is fairly straightforward. Christopher's gonna share a bit about his work and his practice, which I'm really looking forward to. Um, I have a few questions prepared. I've already gotten some questions that were emailed in, um, but that'll be 20-ish minutes. Um, but whenever you have a question throughout the conversation, feel free to drop it in the Q&A section is what I prefer, but if you must, you may use the chat. Um, and we should wrap up within the hour um ish uh, we'll try our best to stay to an hour and um, and we'll go from there in any case i will without further ado introduce christopher Levo. thank you uh, so much <laughs> and emma feel free to interrupt me yeah if, any, if especially if anything relates to anybody else's questions because I, I tend to go off on my own tangent it'd be great you could always pull me back in if you need to sure that sounds great and hopefully both of our dogs behave as I said that my dog started misbehaving. So fingers crossed. Last time he was in a closer room, now he's on the porch. Hopefully he does okay. Um, yeah. So for those of you who don't know Chris's work, he lives and works in Ventura in California. He's an artist, educator, and co-director of Tiger Strikes Asteroid in Los Angeles. I read an interview where you said that three combination of words, curator, educator, organizer, or whatever, is exhausting just to hear those three words together. <laughs> <laughs> or indicate um, somebody's a dilettante. It's one of those <laughs> two things. Exactly. Um, Tiger Strikes Asteroid Los Angeles Gallery, one of four artist-run galleries operating under the TSA banner. His work, mostly egg tempera paintings, ink drawings, and the occasional puppet show, distills historical narratives into a dense, lyrical, stinky storytelling vinegar. He has ex exhibited extensively across the U.S. and Europe, Asia, South America, Oceania, and apparently the polls have absolutely no interest in him or his work. So how's that for a joke? <laughs> not, yet. not yet, one day. So I'll go ahead and let you take over and share your screen and I will okay. disappear from video just to make the experience a bit cleaner. Um, uh, assuming you approve, we'll be sharing the recording of this for those who couldn't attend live. So absolutely. Enjoy, and you will see me momentarily. Okay. One second. There we go. All right. Um, thanks again, Emma, and thank you, uh, everybody working at the gallery and everybody who uh, attended or is attending tonight. Uh, again, I guess I don't have to introduce myself, so I'll ignore that. Um, 
I guess what I wanted to say even before I started is just that, uh, besides thanking you, it's just, you know, it's been 25 years I've been painting. I realized I was putting this together and I had a little biography section. I realized it's, it's been, you know, a quarter of a century. Um, and I finally think, I finally think I might be onto something, which is, I think speaks well of, of uh, painting, that it would take that long for somebody who's pretty dedicated to feel like they might be getting something together. So uh, hopefully you agree. And uh, we'll start with this. You know what, I'll read it because I can't see you guys. I'm just gonna read it because I don't, I, I'm not sure if I believe anybody is out there. So um, I advise everyone to find an island in this life. Find a place where this culture can't take energy away from you. Sap your will and originality. Since anything physical can be mental, that island can be your home. And that's from the Riza. Um, I was actually looking for another uh, Riza quote about um, how uh, odd things grow on islands. You know, he, he's from Staten Island and so am I. Um, but, uh, you know, the idea of creating an island for yourself, uh, a place for you to inhabit, um, that's all your own is a real a dream. And I think art and art making and painting has really become that island for me. Uh, you know, and I think what I wanted to talk about today was sort of my interior uh, process, you know, what I'm thinking when I'm making work uh, and also, the, you know, how I make paintings and stuff. Um, but being able to create a really rich uh, existence in your imagination and have a really fruitful, rooted fantasy life, almost a little bit different than what he said. He's saying, you know, anything that's uh, physical can be mental. I'm really thinking a little bit more about how that which is mental can become almost physical, right? Like a rooted fantasy that if you, if you kind of, um, I think I wrote about recently saying like Geppetto, you know, if you really wish hard enough, uh, somehow these things can, can become as good as real. Um, and then there's the actual islands that are part of my life, you know, so my, my heritage, I guess, uh, my grandparents both came from islands in the Mediterranean, uh, Sardinia, and then this really tiny island, uh, Ventitane, like right in the middle of the ocean, and it's uh, totally tiny. And, um, and then they, they, they decided for some reason that it would be better to move to another island, which is Staten Island you know, uh, which is the Forgotten Borough in New York. And uh, I, I like to think of that as the great tragedy of my existence that happened before I was born, um, I'm second generation. Um, but I think of these, these kind of isolated places that all had their own culture. Um, and there's, this is the island where my grandmother grew up. I don't know if you could see my pointer, but she grew up somewhere over there and then Here's a picture of, of Staten Island. Um, you can see your pointer, by the way. You can, all right, thank <laughs> you. So she lived like right there somewhere. Um, that, that's Ventitane. And then this is the highway, one of the highways that run, ran through Staten, it still runs through Staten Island, but those are the, there's these giant mountains of, of garbage. Um, and you know, I, I don't know, I'm always suspicious when people talk about biography being like a, a it's maybe my my problem, but I'm I'm suspicious when people talk about how important biography is is in their work or how it's uh, determined what they made. I don't think that's necessarily what I'm what I'm saying here, but I think um, what I'm interested in now is how the work that I've been making has actually influenced how I tell the narrative of my biography. So when I say that, oh, this was this kind of uh, tragedy, you know, I'm imagining to myself that there was this possibility. That, uh, that it didn't have to go that way. They didn't have to leave. And that there's just some other version um, of myself that should have happened uh, that stayed there, you know, and then didn't come back here. Um, and that's that kind of thinking, like that way of even, you know, packaging, uh, you know, memory is definitely fallible. And that way of packaging um, my own biography, it's interesting that painting would affect it that much. Um, but I think that's something we all do. And it's something that's been really influential in my work lately. And then a real life event that was um, recent was uh, that affected the path of the work I'm gonna show you tonight was uh, 
the Thomas fires in uh, 2017 in here in Ventura and uh, Santa Paula, kind of south, south of you guys. But the Thomas fires, uh, I had just moved. We bought a house in, in Ventura from Santa Barbara um, maybe a couple years earlier. And like a lot of people here, you know, in California, uh, I had a garage studio. We had a two-car garage that turned into a studio. And uh, I had never experienced anything like that, you know, being relatively new to California. And uh, the next day, I, I uh, we, you know, we evacuated in the middle of the night. And the next day, I came back and, um, uh, you know, a lot of the houses in our block were burning. We actually lost seven, I think, in our neighborhood in the end. And uh, from our vantage point, we're kind of downhill. Uh, we were, we were all, oh, I forgot to do this, hold on, there we go, uh, we forgot to, um, sorry, we didn't forget anything, I forgot to do that, from our vantage point, it totally looked like our, all the houses on our blocks were, were burned, and so um, I had this experience, this kind of brief experience where I, uh, for a day or so, I was positive that all the work that hadn't been, that I hadn't sold or traded uh, everything, that I had stored and everything I was working on had been destroyed. And I was totally convinced. And since you know the, the fire department weren't letting us go up there, I kind of had to sit with that for, for a day or so. And so in the way I was saying, like, you know, in my imagination, uh, I'm thinking about the possibilities of, of uh, history and biography that, that could have happened, you know. For that day, I had the real experience of actually thinking that everything was destroyed. And to my real surprise, um, it wasn't that bad. Like I didn't feel that terrible, uh, you know. And that was that was very surprising to me. You know, I thought, well, I was actually really excited about kind of rolling up my sleeves and uh, getting back to work and starting something new. So everything I've made since then has been really kind of with that mindset that I'm getting a new start, even though I had the nice benefit of not losing stuff. Although um, I guess ironically, just just this, I guess a couple months ago. Uh, uh, somebody who had a lot of my older work, really large work, their house did burn down up in up, up north. And so I did, I did actually wind up losing a ton of work eventually. And, um, and I felt bad. I felt a little bad. So <laughs> I don't know. I don't know which one's reality, uh, wh which of those two impulses is reality. But this is what I was making um, before that, before that uh, incident or non-incident happened, the incident in my mind, I guess. Um, and each of these pieces, uh, these are all egg tempera, uh, these guys. And I think the way I was working was, um, it was still a really kind of intense fantasy world, but uh, each painting was its own island, right? And so, um, for instance, like this one, if I remember correctly, uh, I, had, I had gone home and I was driving through Newark. I had to go back and forth through Newark on the highway a bunch. And I don't know if you've ever been there, um, I recommend it. But uh, there's just thousands and thousands of these um, storage shipping containers. They come over from China and, the, and then they unload them at the port, but it's more expensive to ship them back. So they just keep stacking them. So they become these mountains of, of shipping containers. And I know I should probably be thinking about like uh, the trade imbalance for um, America losing its status in the world. But all for some reason, I just kept thinking like, this would be a great place to like have modern dance or like stage some theater as a space. I just thought it was, it was kind of epic. And uh, so, you know what, I, I would roll down that way and uh, I tried to, I, I had this idea like, oh, well, you know, their shadow should look like the map. And then I was like, oh, there should be, you know, I was, I was thinking about like a uh, modern dance and kind of body positivity. I was like, oh, okay. So it's man, it's a guy who's even bigger than me wearing spandex. And so this is kind of chain, chain reaction of, of, uh, of thoughts, you know, uh, of like a setting and then whatever, I would allow a lot of stuff in and then I would construct a really solid space around a kind of disparate grouping of ideas. Um, and I guess there's the, uh, I don't know if it's Coco Chanel, somebody can fact check this for me. You know, that the idea that like, uh, you're supposed, before you go out, you're supposed to like look in the mirror, turn around and then take something off. I don't know if that's her or not. But anyway, I kind of felt like the opposite. I would like, you know, be in my studio, I would turn around, look back and then like add something, you know? Uh, uh, like just make it kind of a little bit more complicated, a little bit more ridiculous. So like in this case, the Coast Guard helicopter as a spotlight, uh, you know, that's the addition. And I guess I don't have to go into the other one, but like, this is what I was making um, briefly. I think this was, 
something about European health spas, uh, uh, you know, people taking the baths in the water and Egyptology, and that would kind of develop into, into a, a, a painting. It was still somewhat rooted, like I, I still cared about uh, the way the spaces were constructed, but I was pretty generous with, with who, I let, uh, who I let into the paintings. Um, so then- Chris, may yeah. I interrupt you? Just because there's a question that's relevant to the last set of images. Um, this one? Okay. Yeah, the yellow and blue thing that the man is holding, what are those? This? Yeah, I believe. Okay, do you want the honest answer or the, I'll give you that. You know, I was thinking about like, um, oh, what's that, uh, Indiana Jones? You remember Indiana Jones? I'm gonna say yes. I'm gonna say everyone remembers Indiana Jones. But you remember how they had that, um, the, 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 the staff with the ruby in it and then it worked and like the ruby shone a light on the map. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to create a kind of really half-assed kind of version of that. And I was thinking of Egyptology and Ra and there would be like these sun reflectors, but you could see they're kind of tilted. Mm -hmm. So it's like if I built one of those Indiana Jones sticks, because I'm not a great, I'm not a great builder. It would probably be this kind of half-assed sun disc. <laughs> There's your answer for that one. Um, I'm trying to actually remember a visual of, like of the Indiana Jones thing. Maybe we'll have to Google it afterwards. It's a beautiful, it's a beautiful scene. There's a map room and there's a little and the sun comes in at the right angle and the uh, the amulet that he has goes onto a staff. There's some math involved. We could awesome. play it later. Um, before you move on to, we have a question about the scale of the paintings that you're talking about. Oh, thank you, I'm sorry. I, I, in the later stuff, I, I was, I'm more rigorous about that. These are small. These are all, uh, these are probably eight by 10-ish. So. Uh, and the other one, the, the one with the dancers is a tiny bit larger. Got it. Cool. So these are all small. These are probably bigger on your screens than they are in, in real life. All right, I'm going to get disappear again. Like, no, no, that's good. I, I like that helps because uh, so, so, so then this is kind of me uh, restarting. And so if, uh, you know, I, uh, I decided to, um, you know, I said that thing about the Coco Chanel, like, uh, uh, you know, I would look in the mirror and then put some, I just decided to go all the way with that, focus on drawings, uh, which is how I started. I was primarily a, a drawer um, up until, up until, rel you know, relatively recent, up until like seven, I, I think I was painting those egg temper paintings for maybe like six or seven years. No, yeah, from 2010. Before that I had been doing mostly drawings. Um, and I decided to kind of like pull out all the stops and just not be as uh, constructive, not constructive, but not be as critical of how I was constructing things, but to think of it more as poetry. I, I've also was writing more at this time. And so um, I was trying to look for links between what I was writing. Uh, I was writing these kind of short essays and, and drawing and, and I was hoping to have some link with, you know, occupy some weird space between handwriting and uh, painting, you know, through drawing so that images would kind of represent, can kind of represent words, but then also be their, their own, um, whatever they actually, you know, they kind of are on the surface of the page. But, I'm going to um, come back with another interruption and that is, um, do you, uh, I know you have a active writing um, process in addition to your painting and drawing yeah. practice. Do you handwrite your written texts? No. No. <laughs> no, it would, it would make sense that I would, but um, I'm a vicious editor. So like my, my, so I'm, it, it's actually kind of like, they're almost like foils. I should say they're more like foils. So uh, uh, I was looking back at a lot of stuff I've been writing. I don't know that any, anything's even really finished. I would write these essays and they might be six or seven or eight pages. And then I, I'm, I'm kind of brutal. Like I'll just cut them down and cut them down and cut them down till they get to a couple of paragraphs. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it's almost the opposite of, of, it's like a foil to the drawing, I guess, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and have you ever exhibited your writing with these drawings? And you know, I use them sometimes as I, I'll, I'll take like something I'm working on as an essay and I'll use it a, sometimes as a press release for a show. Mm -hmm. um, part of it. And, and, and I guess the difference also, there's like a big difference between what I was doing in writing and what I was doing in drawing is that um, 
when I'm writing, I always, I kind of write about artwork, obscure like artworks or movies or, or, or some other thing that's out there. And, and I'll write about um, other thing, artwork and writing mostly uh, mm -hmm. and movies sometimes. But then in, in, in uh, painting and drawing, I make up, you know, 100% um, asterisks. Mm -hmm. uh, there's one little series that I don't, but um, I make everything up uh, just for my imagination. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Cool. So they're That's complimentary, nice. I guess, but I use them for press releases. I don't know, do, do people read press releases? You Probably uh, you and I both hope that they do. Yeah, I would hope so. I think it depends audience. on how interesting the press release is in like the first two sentences. <laughs> I, if I really, if I could, um, I'm going to send this out there because I don't know who's in the audience, but I would love to have a column. Like, I think that would be my ideal format if I could use my, because they're really short essays. I would love to have a column. I know that doesn't really exist. I mean, it, it, but the kind of, you know, like an unsolicited advice column would be ideal. Great. So that's what my desk looked like at that time. Um, again, I guess, because I had this in my mind that, um, that uh, you know, I shouldn't I shouldn't be so invested in the these think these this work being permanent, you know. Um, I I just felt like I'll just walk I'll work with quickly I work with watercolor and ink, and I really did produce just hundreds and and hundreds of drawings and I would just kind of, I showed some of them but I would just shove them in a you know I'm, there's there's just stacks of them, um, and shove them in a file somewhere, and uh, now I'm looking at it. And you know, so there's some good examples and a lot of stuff that just ended up like this, like not necessarily a marvelous drawing, but it has a kind of good energy. Um, and now I look at it as this like big purge where I was just kind of moving from one stage of life to another or something, just like kind of vomiting everything out, you know? And this, this kind of looks like this painting, this drawing is, is not my favorite, but it just kind of feels like that, you know? Um, I think I read a book about the USS Indianapolis and how, and they had a whole chapter about, um, there's my dog, but a whole chapter about um, how shitty the, the, their um, life vests were. So that's where that came in. I don't know the pie. Um, and so on and so on. Uh, there was, um, sorry, Meadow. Uh, there were a couple of things that I think did um, that I did at that time that kind of stuck with me. I think the idea, um, like crafting a narrative voice, like a voice of a narrator in the drawings. Uh, and in this case, I, I was reading um, or learning about Prester John, who was that, um, I think apocryphal kind of medieval European who traveled to the East and wrote about monopods these people like one leg and people with heads inside their chase and it was very influential um so i was just thinking about traveling um you know going places i guess you know in your imagination but trying to create a, a drawing that had like imagining myself as uh having a narrative voice a, nar a voice of a narrator in the drawings and a lot of that kind of man manifested itself in composition like the relationship between the scale of shapes uh, and then like something like this, where the shifting of a kind of vantage point, you know, and the awkwardness between this space and this and how that works when they relate to, oops, when, how does that relate to the figures in the piece and scale shifts, all these things, kind of stuff that might be in stories or might be in writing um, where voice changes and scene changes, but how, did, how would you kind of compose that? Um, and then here's my asterisk for never ever using references is uh, at the same, around that time, I also found this, this book that was a really terrible, it was really terrible as a nature guide, but really great as a drawing, drawing guide. It was a, or drawings, it was a, a book of wild plants from Western Australia. I found it at a, the Santa Barbara Natural History Museum has their, they, they sell off all their kind of old crusty books every once in a while. And the drawings were beautiful, but they were they were not like I would never be able to tell what the actual plants were. So I just thought I would give it a try. Um, and I again, I was just letting everything out. So I I, uh, I was using these this these plants as a reference, this plant book, and creating spaces for them. But I also here there was a little bit more explicit writing in here that I, I created this as uh, along with this I created this kind of diary, and uh, it was the first kind of high concept thing I'd done in a while, I guess, and. Uh, the idea that there was this anteater from South America and he was a he was a diplomat who had visited Western Australia and he was this kind of like erudite 
guy who kind of, you know, anteater, I guess, who goes to this really um, kind of rough place and is trying to, you know, keep this journal of, 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 of what his life was like. Um, but I also wanted to have it from this kind of alien place. I always liked anteaters. Um, so I was thinking like what, you know, kind of how would he see the world? What would he notice? What would he be interested in? What kind of prejudice would he have? Um, and I think that maybe this was me kind of transitioning out of that everything in the kitchen sink um, drawing style. And it went on for a long time. And I guess something like this would be really, you know, now that I look at it, I see like, oh, th what's happening in the, the drawings I'm just about to show, uh, paintings I'm just about to show you really came together. And this is, um, I think the idea for this was that there would be multiple, uh, mu there's like multiple disasters happening simultaneously from different times in the same space. So there's like the, the KT extinction from the late Cretaceous, you know, with the dinosaurs and then uh, the sack of Rome by the Gauls and then World War I, somehow like, put it in the blender and then try and reform it somehow. And I don't think that's terribly far off from where I'm at now. I think it just doesn't look the same and it's less thought out, but that same impulse to kind of squish these things together and collapse time is really important to me now. So, so close that chapter. Uh, I mean, it really was two years. It was a lot of time just drawing and I got back to egg tempera. I just thought I just took a snapshot the other day of of some of my uh, oops shit I'm over time um, so there's just some of the pigments I work with egg temper so um, these are all different uh, metals and minerals materials so there's cobalt oxide of chromium it's just fascinating to me um, that all we use is the egg yolk when I make egg, these paintings all I use is the egg yolk um, you separate it put a little bit of water and then these are all just ground pigment. So, you know, this is a uh, cadmium, you know, cobalt, uh, iron oxide, all this stuff. Um, I love how direct it is. And um, even the colors might look the same, they behave differently because of what they're made out of. Uh, and it's been, it's taken me a long time to like discover the nature of each of the colors and their materiality. And then real quick, this is a, uh, these panels that I make are gesso. It's a traditional uh, gesso. So you heat up rabbit skin glue, it's like a two or three day process to make these panels. And that's what I paint on. So you rabbit skin glue and chalk. And I like to paint on top of a black background or dark background. So I use, um, uh, uh, what kind of black is carbon? Doesn't matter, black pigment. <laughs> and um, you heat it up and you slowly paint many, many layers. And then you kind of sand it down. It ends up looking a lot like a chalkboard or a slate. Um, and then this is, these these are brushes I bought 15 years ago in New York or more, and they were they were on they were like 80% off, and they were still like 100 bucks a piece. And I've I've only used this one ever once, and I've never used this one because I'm scared to use them. And these are the shitty Dick Blick brushes I use. That's more of a confession. So um, I'm going to try and do this quickly, uh, but Take that's what I'm. Like, what's fine. that? Take your time. You're fine. Oh, I am fine. Okay, thank you. So uh, that brought me to um, the two series I really did want to share with you. That was all lead up. That was a long intro. Um, and so, you know, I, I think I mentioned it really quickly. It was interesting because I, I didn't think of it, but it was Groundhog's Day on Tuesday. And I love that movie. And every year I watch it, um, you know, and it's like the perfect example of a high concept narrative. You know, there's a very... Um, there's a big setup, right? And you guys, he lives the same day every life. Like, you know, it, uh, all the logic in the movie and all the drama and all the kind of pathos all revolves around uh, this kind of artifice, you know? And so for these genie paintings, um, I started right after that. Um, the concept I had in my mind, I don't have it down to like a good log line pitch or whatever was that uh, if there is a genie trapped in a bottle, you know, let's say in the 1600s or something, uh, and it got released, like, would its frame of reference be from the 1600s? Like, would it only know, you know, it's locked in, I guess it's like us, right? It's locked up for a t period of time. So like, would it, what would it know about contemporary life? And, it, and if it's in there long enough, you know, had I unlocked one or let one free and I was asking, which, would it even understand like what the hell I'm asking it? Like it would be it, the communication, right? So 
basically it boils down to like a farce, right? That uh, my idea was that there's this, you know, I would unlock a genie and that I'd ask for things, but it wouldn't really be able to fulfill them. And, uh, and then hilarity would ensue. And like, you know, it's just, it's just a point of departure for me to kind of uh, start, you know, uh, um, start these paintings. That's what I was thinking of. And, you know, I also knew that there's this weird history of what a genie was um, and that there's the, that in, in ancient Rome and Greece, the genius was a household protector saint, you know, it's like a, your ancestors would protect their home. So it's kind of like a household ghost. Um, and then, you know, that kind of morphed and evolved. And then you get like, uh, I can't remember that movie with um, Sinbad, but you, you get the idea, it became a genie. So um, I started these paintings and, and you know, I think my the paintings, it would took, you know, it'd been a long time since I painted Egg Temper. So I didn't, I'm not showing the first three or four I made. They're pretty terrible. Um, it's a big, big switch. You know, they're made out of these paint. This is another small painting. This is probably, you know, I don't know, eight or nine inches, but it's just made out of thousands of little brush strokes. So I had to learn how to do that again, but also like, I think I had to work out my imagination muscle. So like, uh, which worked well for this because, you know, your first wishes would probably be really kind of silly. So my first thoughts were like, well, I guess if I could get anything I wanted, I probably would go back in time and like eliminate the monotheistic religions. It's like, well, that seems like, it, but that's a kind of crummy idea. So here's like a painting about that. And then as I'm evolving, you know, it became a lot more about the dialogue between uh, myself and the genie. So I would, I would write down before I, I started each painting, I would write down a wish. Then I would write down something from the genie's perspective of like an answer. And then the third line would always be some sort of, almost like a joke, I guess, would be kind of like a punchline thing. And then those became the titles. And um, I started writing them on the painting. So. Uh, it took me a while to figure out how to do that, but in the end, I, I kind of, um, I always loved watching uh, European movies in black and white, and they would have these bright yellow subtitles. It seemed like such an odd choice, so I put them in there. And then this one's called, you know, you've given me what I asked for, not what I wanted. And that seemed like, I don't know, it seems like a middle age, seems like a middle age project in general, right? Like you start to attain things and you realize they're not what you thought they were. And, uh, and then your priorities have to shift. So this dialogue, you know, becomes increasingly, uh, my, my requests become increasingly ornate, you know, uh, as, as it goes along and then they, it has its implications. And again, like I said, there's this kind of idea of like a rooted fantasy in that as you come up with these things, they should have consequences, you know, and the consequences should be, you know, you should be able to describe the consequences and, and uh, build it piece by piece. So in this one, this is really tiny. This is less than six inches square, but I had the idea of um, like, what if I made a slightly better looking version of myself? Like that would be a good wish to have a slightly better looking version of yourself so that you still could fool people. They would think it was you, but like you had been to the beach or you'd been like, you started running or something. And then that guy could do all your, that guy could take care of all your public stuff. And then you could go, uh, go do your other thing. And then I was, you know, you, you start to have questions, you know, I was thinking about um, what would the essence of the personality be of that kind of clone? Oh, there's, you know, stuff other people thought before, but I'm just, I'm, this is the kind of mindset, this helped me build paintings and make decisions even about color, you know? I was really proud of this awkward bronzy color. And so in this one, uh, you know, narrative wise, it started to evolve a little bit. Um, I have to look at it to read what the title is. It doesn't really matter. But uh, my idea was that, the, that uh, I would go to Lusitania and stage, stage a disaster, you know, stage myself kind of jumping aboard to kind of fool the, fool the people on the ship. And I was thinking like, that's the kind of sad thing you would do if you wanted to become friends with somebody in junior high school. You know, like I want to become friends with the genie because he's all powerful and like, you would almost like trick other people. Um, and then really, I guess, I guess the other thing was, I was really thinking about uh, getting more and more into the color at this point and uh, pushing the boundaries a little bit of the space. Um, I made a lot of paint. I don't know how many, yeah, I started making more and more of these 
kind of elements of the ocean and thinking about how do you uh, depict something that's mobile and liquid. And uh, the result is often awkward. Um, but, you know, I kind of celebrate that, that awkwardness. Uh, this is not a great image. I'm sorry. I did love this painting, but, you know, uh, I included this just because this is a painting that the, as far as the narrative goes, it was getting, you know, for Vance kind of getting towards the middle of the end of this kind of arc. Um, but this is the first painting, you know, uh, where I really wanted to keep it and not sell it. Like somebody asked for it. Um, and and I said, like, you know, I, I don't want to, not right now. And that's very, un, you know, I normally don't care uh, and I'll sell it. And it was the first time that kind of happened to me. And I said, well, if I show it a bit, then, then you know, call me back. And then I didn't assume the person would call back. And then I did show and they called me back and asked for it. So I did eventually sell it. But I thought, just as far as me, it was the first time I really felt like I was committed to um, what I was making in such a way. I don't know, it's interesting. Like I said, it's 25 years. It was really strange to have that feeling now. But I, don't, I, I must have made a, a trillion things so far and I never had that happen to me. So that's good, you know, uh, there are times when you feel like you could, uh, it's such a ridiculous profession or not profession, but vocation. Uh, it felt good at this stage to, to be able to connect with what I was making. Whether or not it's good, I'm not 100% sure, but I'm glad that that connection's there, that's valuable. Um, so this was, this was kind of like the, I would say this is like the peak of that series. Uh, and this is very large for me. This is like 30 by 40 inches. And this took me a couple of months to make. Um, I, again, because I'm, I'm pretty, you know, dogmatic about the not using the references. I also don't do a ton of sketching. So if there's any of my students don't listen to that, but so I like to rework on the, I like to rework it on the actual panel, like redraw it and redraw it and redraw it. And um, by this point in narrative, you know, I have, I have like a new, a new kind of doppelganger and I live complete. I, I live solely in outer space, you know, uh, and I have, uh, you know, a pigeon that that takes me around in space. You know, the narrative in my mind has got so ornate, um, and uh, I was trying to tie, you know, thinking about morality and tying in kind of middle class morality to this complete uh, insane fantasy world. Uh, it's like a hard thing to reconcile, and I think the further field I got with, you know, kind of how I was imagining the fantasy uh, and then trying to think about how you rationalize the moral decision making in this thing, it created these weird, you know, I think that's what that tension uh, is what helped create these kind of bizarre spaces. And this is the last one that I made from this series. There's a few of that. I, there's a bunch that I didn't include in here. Um, and this is kind of like the end of the party. I don't know if we need to go into this one. I think you should. I read okay. about it. <laughs> you read about it. Okay. So I guess this is the one where, uh, by the time I got to this painting, like I, I was actually kind of exhausted um, just by, like I was starting to work and I felt like there was this big burden of having to think through the wishes. And I stopped writing. I, I didn't write on this one. Um, but I was trying to come up with more and more kind of complicated spaces. So I, I did this weird thing with the water where, where, uh, I was trying to draw it like you were actually looking through the water and then I have the the genie like giant and very awkwardly on top with a couple of toes and then this is kind of like you know my thought process was like if I if if I the real Chris you know could get whatever I would wanted in life like if I became a billionaire I kind of felt like I basically would end up evolving into a frat boy in some way you know it was kind of disappointing it was like a weird uh, mental exercise like well, if you really had everything you could, I was like, you know, eventually I had, um, there was like Elvis in a, in a dome doing the 68 special. And uh, I was trying to think of like what my taste would be like. And so I was like, well, probably, you know, I had this kind of Russian thing. I was like, oh, you're kind of like an oligarch. If you had unlimited funds, you know, you get that taste. It's like, or um, remember Saddam had those gold toilets. It's like, that's what, that's what happens when you get whatever you want. So I created these onion domes that also kind of look weirdly like kind of gross. They look a little condomy, you know? So it's like a reflection of the, the, the de-evolution of my taste, <laughs> this painting. I love it. I think Jackie is in the audience, Jackie Rhines. When you mentioned the gold toilets, I thought of her, <laughs> her work. Yeah. Uh, 
I have many questions for you and a few sure. questions from the audience. Um, yeah, sure. yeah. Uh, thank you so much for sharing. I keep, yeah. I like kept trying to zoom in closer to see all the detail in your work. So um, I suppose if people want to see hefty images, they can go to your website. I think they're better. Yeah, okay. they're better. I mean, it was totally fine. It's just honestly, um, my computer screen is quite small. There, yeah, yeah. One of the pandemic issues is that I have not done a lot of great documentation. Yes, uh, it's a challenge. It is a challenge, yeah universal challenge um, and yep. I guess my first question very important pressing question is where do you source your eggs oh you know I have chickens oh perfect I was yep. hoping that would be the answer and it wasn't like Trader Joe's or something so excellent um, and then you talk I mean throughout you're talking about your work it feels like your brain is full of all lots of tidbits of information historical ecological bug information that yeah. like gets all smorgasbordered together and then outbirds the painting. And I, I suppose um, I want to hear a little bit about like how formal or not formal that research and thought process is, or whether you're just consuming information and thoughts. And um, yeah, I, I'm I, like, how, how do you document the things that you learn that you want to include or not include? Yeah, I, I just feel like I've been at it a long time. And I listen, well, the informal stuff is I listen to audiobooks in the studio. Um, I didn't, actually, it's interesting. I didn't, during those genie paintings, I didn't actually listen to, I listen to music only. Mm -hmm. um, but but for the most part, I listen to audiobooks. And then and I do read a lot. I, I, uh, I went to an engineering high school and then I went to art, art school throughout. So uh, it's interesting. I've been talking a lot, and I have I have kids now. You know, I have two two daughters, and um, I'm working on my younger one with a lot of English right now. And um, New York City public schools weren't very good, so I don't have a great formal, like especially when it comes to uh, writing, I don't have a really great formal education with that because I, I did go to like I did a, I went to a great high school, but it was all math and science, and then I went straight to art school. I didn't really have to write any papers, so. Mm -hmm. um, I'm working now on kind of like making, I mean, I have been working in past years for making up for some of those skills. Like, you know, other things grow, but I've been doing that. Uh, I don't study, I don't read about art very much. I mm -hmm. have to admit, like I read a lot about history mm -hmm. um, all the time. So I, I do that. And then I've been, um, the other stuff I'm really kind of weirdly serious about is like my hobbies are important to me. So I, I um, up until recently, just because of the pandemic, like I was really into, into, um, like fighting a lot, you know, like, uh, um, and then sailing and uh, telescope making. So like, I've been trying to learn, I like going to, while I'm painting, I like learning things that I, I don't, I know nothing about. And then that seeps in a lot. So a lot of the stuff from there, and you could see there's, I have a lot of kind of sailing paintings. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, because that's, you know, and like, that's really helped me because it's a really amazing way to experience space and time and movement, you know? So I try to, I try to go out there Mm -hmm. do that but I don't know if that answers if that helps but it does and I also was thinking a lot about um I hope this makes sense outside of my brain but the ways that it seems like you give yourself permission in your work you give yourself permission to yeah. explore fantastical things like the genie which ends up being really an exploration of your own desires and yeah you actually desire what you think you desire and um I'm, I don't know, it's, it's less of a question and more whether you have any comments on like the permission you give and the space you create or rituals you create around making work. That I think that I, I'm really, I'm, I'm really serious about the island thing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I have like a totally awesome middle class lifestyle. I have, I have two kids in a house and like a lawn and stuff, but you know, I'm, I'm very strict, uh, you know, there's a whole separate like universe that I, I have and it's it's just you know you got to create that that um barrier I think or at least for me I need to create like a very strong barrier mm -hmm. but also then like you know um like just allowing like a uh, uh forcing yourself to be vulnerable mm -hmm. and open to things it's hard you know it's not it's something that takes practice so like this is a, this is the kind of painting where like uh I would say it's kind of like almost like exercise, like really forcing yourself to think about, um, you know, there's factoids, like this is Sperlonga, which is a place 
uh, in Italy and like thinking about, I don't know, I, I, I guess I guess I'm answering your question already. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think it's like, you know, you should, for me, it's like, it's not, I don't do this for, for money. Like even when I used to sell tons of work and never made a lot of money, mm -hmm. it's like, what's the, what the hell's the point of doing this unless you're gonna go to some deep, dark place, you know? To me, yeah. otherwise it's the worst thing in the world to do with your time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's like okay. the most effort for the least reward in life, I think is probably being an artist. But it's like- yeah, a it's kind of like the same life. thing. I think about this in terms of, you know, the measure of success in small, I mean, I were in San Luis Obispo, which is a small community. Yeah. You know, there's a very dedicated group of people who are really interested in contemporary art and in art in general. Um, yeah. But it's certainly not like New York City by any means. And so I've had to, in my organizing and curating in this area, I've had to think a lot about, it's kind of like, what's the measure of success? It's like, is the measure of success a whole bunch of people? Is the measure of success you sell all your work for thousands of dollars or that, that you um, give yourself permission in a new way? Um, I think it's interesting. Um, do you collect anything? I, I do collect. I mean, I, I just bought. I just bought a. Uh, I sold some work this this past weekend. So I, I I used all that money and bought a bunch of artwork this week. I was like, as soon as I got it, I bought. Um, uh, I just bought. I just bought this really great. Um, why am I forgetting his name right now? Uh, I just bought some drawings. I'm really excited about it. You know, it's funny. I heard the collect question. At, this was an audience question. As like, do you collect like? rocks or like do you oh, objects yeah yeah, yeah. i mean that goes here's that's a i have fossils on my desk i mean yeah i found these at the park cool <laughs> um, um uh i noted that you made this just dist distinction and i think this is good for um any students who are listening in um the distinction between being an artist as a profession versus a vocation yeah. and i wondered if you could speak to that a little bit oh yeah i guess that's you know um like my my uh my art professional stories like a lot of i actually just reconnected with a friend from from new york from a while back but um i came out of grad school in 2004 you know and it was a big bubble and i was in i went back i moved back to new york and it was a big bubble market. And so um, I went to a good grad school with some lovely people. And, uh, you know, I got picked up really quickly by a, a, a gallery um, and and kind of was not very mature about, well, not that I was immature, I wasn't very uh, aware of how that whole system worked. And, uh, you know, I didn't, I didn't realize, I didn't know what a bubble was and I didn't know how it affect me, but I got, got swept up pretty quickly and there were some great opportunities, but um, in the long run, it was a really terrible kind of thing because in 2008, everything crashed. And then, uh, you know, there's a lot of people who got, um, whose work was really expensive, who were young like myself and I had a lot of friends. And so there's a whole ecosystem out there and it, I, I guess it pays to learn about it. It definitely pays to learn about it, be knowledgeable, but um, you know, for me, I uh, I think you know it's like this is something I want to do for my life, and I need to do. And uh, if I think about it as like um, in the way that a, a a priest or a monk would think about what they do, mm -hmm. then then every day is a win. Mm -hmm. um, I do want to share more. You know, yeah, it, like I think now, like I'm moving to a stage where I'm confident in a lot of work. You know, I want to share more with other people and and meet those artists, and that's partially why I started the TSA in LA and. Mm -hmm. is, is to have a community because that's also tremendously important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we talk a lot about that. We've been doing a series with um, alum from Cuesta and um, yeah, we talk a lot about the importance of community and actually how challenging it is to find and how particularly challenging it is to find and maintain during COVID. So um, I appreciate those comments. Um, Couple of other questions, if you're okay with it. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, do you um, have any favorite artists? Somebody mentioned that some of your work reminds her of the art of Pink Floyd's album, The Wall. <laughs> do any um, images come to you? In you know what? I, I have to say, I've never owned The Wall. <laughs> Me neither. Okay. Um, that's that British guy. Is that the British guy with the splatters? No. I can't remember his yeah, name. I don't know. I don't know who did that. You know who comes to my actually, I always think of writers more than I do uh, of artists, but right now, like off the top of my head, you know who like my hero, like a hero, I'm thinking I've been uh, looking back at like Edward Gorey's work 
mm-hmm. a little bit more. Uh, and I read his biograph- uh, a biography about him a while ago and I found it strangely moving and like very inspirational. I think um, his relationship to the ballet, I think was really totally fascinating. And, um, you know, I used to go to the opera a lot. And so I've been thinking about him and then um, I've been, I've been, uh, I've been reading and rereading um, essays by Max Beerbohm, who's like a, a kind of British writer, um, essayist uh, and critic. And um, Patrick Lee Fermer has been like, um, as far as writers in the past like year or two, he's been like my kind of pandemic savior. Uh, Patrick Lee Fermer's writing on, um, he walked from, in the 1930s, he walked from um, the hook of, of Holland all the way to uh, Constantinople Mm. on foot in the 30s you know before the war and it's just kind of over the course of three books he wrote it in the 70s um but it you know he, he what's the name I'm, i want to put it in the chat patrick lee firmer he, he died relatively recently he lived forever and he lived in he went he, he uh ended up living in greece and writing a ton of amazing books about greece but um as a young man in the 30s you know he did this kind of adventure mm-hmm. And um, he actually became a kind of uh, resistance fighter, but that happened later. But, uh, and then as an older man in the seventies, he found, you know, he had all these diaries and, and rewrote, wrote them into books. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's a snapshot of a kind of a world right, right on the verge of collapse. But you also kind of know that this person who wrote it knows, kind of kept his great balance from the past and the future because he was writing, even though he knows what happens, but he's, hmm trying to write it and maintain that kind of innocence of the person who, who wrote it in the beginning. And I think uh, that's my big recommendation, I guess. Hmm. Love it. I will, I haven't heard of either of these people. So I personally will have to look it up. Um, do you, um, in terms of the objects and figures in your work, do you, um, do you use models or still lives or you just draw from your memory and your brain? It's a hundred percent, except for those like little drawings of, um, you probably can tell sometimes, uh, except for those like drawings with that, um, that used the plant book, I, I use zero, zero um, references at all. Uh-huh. And the uh-huh. theory, is, I, I feel like it's not like some macho thing. I think the theory is like, I, I want things to be wrong consi- in the same consistent way. I think that's what character is, right? Character is like consistent flaws. Mm-hmm. So to me, like I'd rather have things be wrong consistently in some interesting, in some way that makes it different than other things. So I think the way to do that is like trying to remember what the hell a uh, capuchin monkey looks like. Mm-hmm. Like that's hard, you know, it's just kind of think about it. I was like, well, whatever goes wrong, goes wrong. Mm-hmm. You know? And um, that'll only make it slightly better. Mm-hmm. I love or it. Not. Or not. <laughs> No, I love it. I wrote that down. Character or consistent flaws. I, I'm going to muse on that. Like this was just trying to remember how the hell, like I had to rebuild like the whole rooted fantasy thing. So this painting, I, I had these because like, I have no idea what I'm doing. Like I just mm-hmm. draw and I draw and I try and draw it out. That and kind then, of answers one other question that was about whether these paintings live first as drawings or what they're. I draw on here. And like what happened with this one is I realized how like, because I do some sailing, I was like, "What? Nobody would ever put a mast back there," and it would—it it made it like a bad ship, mm-hmm. and I just couldn't live with it. So eventually, like, I had to move the mast. I had to make everything down, and so eventually, the painting became became this. And you could see I put the. This is called boomvang. Everybody, it's a boomvang. Keeps this topping lift. It's all in there. Uh huh. So like, I don't know. That's all. All that stuff is. I think that's a difference. Like the same thing about not using references is like the degree that you're willing to follow through with, you know, there's a difference between having it be worth looking at or not. Mm-hmm, absolutely, absolutely. Um, one more question um, and uh, I'm just gonna read it. Your mind is a serious labyrinth of information, I concur. Um, do you have any advice for students in the audience about how to arrive on a subject matter or really the importance of following your own interests? Oh, that's great. Brittany asked that question. Brittany, okay. <laughs> you know what? I think I, I think the thing is to shop around, and you know what I what I really like is um. I guess you could do this on the internet too, but you know I always would look in the bibliography if there was like a book that I found interesting. Mm-hmm. I'd always like look in the bibliography and see what 
they were. And so like that gory, that every gory book, I don't think it was even that it was, he was so interesting. It was that, um, I love that the book had all about what he was interested in. Mm -hmm. So like, and then I would look up those, those kind of books. And then eventually, hopefully if you spread yourself out and I guess the other thing, you know, you'll find what you'll find something you love. The other thing is like, I try to force myself to like things I don't like, if that mm -hmm. makes sense. Mm -hmm. You know, so if there's something I really just have a visceral, like I'm like, that sucks. Then I was like, well, come on. You, that means you're passionate about. So then like, I would investigate things you reflexively don't like. Do you experiment in other medium besides painting or writing? Uh, yeah, you know, I have, uh, oops, not that. Uh, I've been making these screens lately. Mm -hmm. I didn't show them, but <laughs> I do this. I do puppet shows. Um, mm -hmm. I don't think I have any images of that, but I started making these screens. I wanted to make furniture. I don't know, this is distemper. So it's, it's just rabbit skin glue with pigment. Um, that, and the puppet shows were good. They're just very labor intensive. So I don't do them anymore. I used to do shadow puppet shows. Um, anything that takes tons of effort and only a few people can see, mm -hmm. I'll do it. <laughs> you know? Have you thought about doing a virtual one? It, you know, honestly, it's, 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 uh, it, it involves so much coordination of people. Yeah, yeah. That yeah. I, I don't see myself uh, in the same way. Um, I think curating, uh, I think it's best to leave, I'm sure you'll agree, curating is best to leave it to the professionals. Mm -hmm. And you can see this is the last show I curated. This is right before the pandemic. Um, but like trying to organize all this stuff, like I, I, it was fun, but I think, I think I'm, there's Jackie's, there's a Jackie piece. Oh, yeah. I feel like that was kind of, you know, um, collaborative working process mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that, um, and this is a show Jackie curated. Awesome. We should have this be about Jackie, trunk show. Um, but this is, so yeah, I mean, I do, I, I do, but um, I think I realize now that um, uh, it's probably smart to, um, it's probably smart to consolidate and, mm -hmm. and um, really focus on, for me at least, I, I need to focus a little bit more on painting because um, like I said, 25 years, I finally feel like I'm getting somewhere, so. Mm -hmm. well, well I think we can start wrapping up oh do you remember your dreams they're wicked boring <laughs> there's, nothing like, there's not not <laughs> nothing exciting I had one about I had one where the only one I can remember recently was a fishbowl filled with hot dogs which feels like you don't need to be a Freudian analysis to feel like, it was like Matisse you know the Matisse fishbowl the gold particularly gold. boring Seems kind of obvious. <laughs> like, I couldn't even. Sometimes a cigar. Sometimes a hot dog is just a hot dog, I guess. I love it. And then I suppose as we close, because we don't have any more questions coming in, I was thinking a lot throughout our talk um, about how, you know, a, a lot of artists deal with play in their work, and there's lots of conversation around how yeah. to play. and. Um, you've spoken about this idea of the space that your process creates um, in terms of the island. Um, but I don't know if you have any sort of closing thoughts on how the element of play, um, how you see it informing your work, or if it does. I think it, you know what, I think um, I'm trying to be an optimist. Like, I, I feel like, a, you know, I, I don't know, I guess I said some things that weren't like, you know, talking about how hard it is as a profession versus a vocation, but um, just being able to make anything, you know, is such a, to me, uh, you know, when I go to look at work, I love, I, I really do, like when I go to see shows or even just see anything serious, I love like 90% of what I see. I'm just like, it's just so exciting to see mm -hmm. like any, like just seeing, if you see two colors together that I like, I get really excited, you know? so. I, th I think that, um, so maybe that's not play, but I think it's amazing that there's some things and, and color is definitely one of those things where simply putting two colored, you know, colors next to each other can actually produce like joy. That seems to me like such a great, uh, such a great thing to have access to, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? So I just try to keep looking for that. I guess that would be kind of the most playful thing I could think of that kind of uh, 
kind of dumb joy you get when 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 a couple of colors work together you know well it's really refreshing to hear that like i feel like so um so much of the art the art world worlds are is so much more competitive than that so to hear somebody truly celebrating other artists in a way and it seems like that really informs your work at tiger strikes asteroid which we didn't get to discuss that at all that's but fine. another yeah. time um i think that's you know a really lovely philosophy to walk around the world with looking at things you know i never I, yeah i'm glad i guess i'm glass half full we should all be glass half full right now <laughs> i guess yeah. it's good to be you know um, urgent, urgent question coming in on the chat under the finish line. Uh, what are the names of your chickens? Uh, I can't remember right now. No, uh, JJ and April. We used to have, it was, it was originally, um, May, April, April, May, and June. May died. Then June became JJ. I wasn't, I don't know. I, I missed it. So my kids are in charge of that, that aspect of it. Well, um, this has gone by so fast and it's very, I, like, I feel like we could keep talking and talking. So I really, really appreciate your time and your patience as we got this organized. Um, uh, a comment, you should, I'm going to send you the transcripts of the chat because you have lots of fans, but one comment is your sheer inventiveness is such a joy to experience. And I really agree. So thank you for spending Sweet. that time with thank us. Thank you so much. Thanks for inviting me. It's so, uh, such a pleasure to be able to do it today. Yeah, and I really hope, I mean, Santa Barbara is really an Ventura, Santa Barbara, not that far away um, from San Luis Obispo. And so it'd be fun to brainstorm other ways that we can collaborate or- Oh, 100%, you know, yeah. You know. I know you're friends with a lot of the um, faculty at Cal Poly and obviously friends with um, Brittany at Cuesta, so- You guys have a great community up, you guys have a great community up there. So I love visiting there as well, anytime, so. Yeah, if we can ever see each other in person again. <laughs> That's no I have a big door on my studio. There's lots of ventilation. We're okay. Yeah, perfect. Well, thank you again. And for thank you so um, much. if you think that somebody, for, for those who are listening, if you know somebody who might enjoy the recording, I will get it uploaded here pretty soon. And you can just subscribe to our newsletter to get the, net, the latest. I will also share it with Christopher so that he can share it around as he wants. Oh, I man. like that I call you Christopher and so many people are calling you Chris and I'm like committed to Christopher. I, I didn't we get we didn't get to that part. I refer to myself as Uncle Chris a lot. So I think <laughs> people know me they in the third person. Um so Katya, yeah, to your question, um either subscribe to our newsletter or I'll make sure that um Christopher shares it out as well. So thank you all for spending your Thursday night with us. Our next event at the Miosi Gallery is an artist talk with the laboratory series um on February 25th, okay. which is a Thursday, a couple of weeks from now, we're going to be meeting with Chelsea Flowers, who is a um, an artist based at performance and mixed media artist based in Washington, DC. So please keep in touch and enjoy your Thursdays and your weekends. Thank you so much. Hey, everyone. Bye. Bye.